Welcome to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere. I'm Whitney Oaks, Research Associate at the Center for Rural Policy and Development. This week on the Center of Everywhere, we'll hear from Ben Winchester and Kelly Ash as they discuss our newest State of Rural report, which uses statewide data to clear up some of the narrative myths perpetuated about rural Minnesota. Tune in for a conversation about the housing market, total population infatuation, and workforce shifts. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the show. Here at the Center for Rural Policy and Development, we have just released our annual State of Rural report. Something we do every year, uh, it's actually dictated in state legislation that kind of produce a whole bunch of data and statistics on rural Minnesota. Anything from demographics to economics to housing to agriculture to the top five industries in each county, all these kinds of things are in this big data dump of a report. One of the things that we find interesting, or I should say frustrating, about a lot of data dumps, particularly related to rural Minnesota, is that they usually just focus on like three main things, uh, one of them being population decline, the second one being the gap in wages, uh, or a third one being, oh, it's all egg or all it's all tourism, or just trying to find some sort of singular definition to define our counties and our rural areas as being one thing. The state of rural tries to get through some of that. It can be kind of hard. You know, data is is what it is and it can tell a singular story, but at least we try to provide a lot of different data points to give a more nuanced picture and narrative about what's happening in rural Minnesota and the complexities and diversity that we're seeing throughout our regions. I say this today because I brought on board uh, Ben Winchester, who is a researcher at the University of Minnesota Extension here, somebody that I've learned under for a number of years. There's a number of us working in rural community and economic development and research and data trends that have, I think, been inspired by Ben and some of his work over the past 10, 15 years, maybe even 20 years now, trying to look at data in a different way that paints a, a, a more nuanced picture about our rural areas and trying to find some, or not even trying, but seeing some positive trends that rural areas can focus on. And Ben, thanks for being on the show today. And I'm just going to ask the, the first question that I always find kind of intriguing, and I know you get pretty pumped about it, is, you know, what do you feel like is one of the most overlooked statistics and data points about rural Minnesota? Yeah. Hi, Kelly. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here and to talk about rural communities, the things that we all love. I, I think one of the more surprising pieces is the inequity between the narrative and the data, <laughs> you know, as, as many of you may have heard that, you know, on, on one hand, we have a rural narrative of dying and death and decline and, you know, stagnancy in our rural communities. But on the other hand, I would just argue if all our small towns are dying, then why can't I find a house to buy? In fact, we know it's been all virtually impossible to find a home to buy across rural Minnesota for the past, not just pandemic years, but for the past 10 years, we've been talking about a workforce and housing shortage. So for me, this really, uh, we should be telling the story uh, of a vibrant rural, of a diverse rural, of a rural that it, it has a lot of meaning and, and is a choice for people as they uh, primarily get into their 30s and 40s. So for me, it's a celebration of where rural is and where we brought ourselves rather than where we've been. And is there a specific statistics that you feel like represents that like better than most? You know, we always talk about population decline. So what's a better representation of what's actually happening in our small towns? Yeah, and this is uh, really vital for me is, you know, we, I want to, I call it total population infatuation. We're always infatuated with our total population. Like, did our numbers go up or go down? And I call it the like Ricky Bobby approach. So if you saw the Talladega Nights, the, the movie, it, it, he would always say, if you're not winning, you're losing. Well, uh, if you're not gaining, you're losing when it comes to your population. So, and I think we, we believe that, and, you know, the census data comes out and everybody wants to see the new maps. Like, hey, did our numbers go up or go down? And, you know, is our sign outside of I'm going to go up or down, go down, because if it goes down, we're going to feel worse about ourselves. And why is that? It's because we tend to use it, that as an indicator for a success and failure when, in fact, when we look at a majority of our rural communities and, and counties across this country, not only have communities been relatively stable in their population, i.e., you know, losing less than 2 or 3% of their population, which I can explain some of that loss in a minute, but at the same time, like, for example, Minnesota here, I think we had um, lost 49% of our counties up through 2019, and we'll talk about the 2020 data in a minute, The 29, up through 2019, 
almost half the counties had lost their population, but in 92% of the counties, they gained housing units. And how can that be? How can we increase the number of housing units but our population go down? And that is because our average household size is smaller. And when you know in our rural communities, we have many more households that are occupied by seniors. And these seniors, you know, they don't have kids, so they've already trickled down the population when their kids left, if they left. Um, and now these two people are staying in their home. And as they age into their 60s, 70s, and 80s, these people are staying in their homes longer than any previous generation. And so in a way, what we see is our population can continue to trickle down just by individuals passing away. So you may have two seniors in a home, one of them passes away, the surviving spouse stays there. So what happens in the data is our population just went down by one, but our occupied housing units stayed the same because that surviving spouse stayed in that home. So this has been a general trend over the years. Even looking back to 1940, the average household size in 1940 was 3.6 people. Today, it's 2.6. Like you are going to lose 29% of your population by doing nothing except existing in the modern world. So I think this is part of the narrative that we don't always understand when we look at these total numbers. We want them to go up, and when they go down, we have no explanation other than to say, nobody wants to live in rural communities anymore. That's why our rural numbers are going down. But I will argue that our homes are a very uh, stable source of residency. It's just that the number of people in each of our homes has gotten, on average, smaller, which leads to this reduction. One of the real indicators I see for success is that, you know, even today, 30% of our rural homeowners are over the age of 70, or really almost over the age of 75, a full third of our homes are owned by people over the age of 75. And these people, as I mentioned earlier, are staying in their homes longer than any previous generation. So typically in the past, once people hit the age of 62 or 63, they would start not becoming homeowners anymore. They would move into a different kind of home. They would move into a different kind of environment. They may move in with their kids. Kids, which we're starting to see a return to multi-generational housing now too. But in the past, people would remove themselves from home ownership and they would move out of that house. And what happens when a person moves out of that house? There is room for people to move into that house in that community and then bump up that population. Well, for the past eight years now, these senior populations have remained in their homes at a rate higher than any previous generation. So, so in my view, this has actually inhibited the ability for our small towns to welcome in new people, to welcome in new workforce. And we can't just throw up our arms and yeah, as a business owner and say, hey, community, there's no housing around here. I can't you know, get a workforce here because there's no homes. Well, our homes are filled. And right now, the only way to bring in new people is to have people move out or move over of the homes that already exist. Because in many ways, building new housing is not an option in 90% of our rural communities. And so really, our existing housing stock for me is the primary unit of analysis. It's one of the biggest assets we've got in our small towns because these houses were a home to someone before. They're a home to someone today, and they'll be hopefully a home to someone in the future if that home is in good enough shape to pass on to the next generation. I, I know you've referred to it as churn, this kind of churn, particularly among our elderly residents uh, in rural Minnesota. And, and yeah, the data is really clear as to how many of our single family homes are filled by, by folks that are elderly. It's very stark difference in our rural areas compared to metropolitan areas. That's right. And it's interesting. I mean, this is where data gets really interesting to me, particularly in a rural area, is that people will look at the issue and be like, well, this is a supply side issue. We don't have enough transitional housing or maybe assisted living facilities for people to move into. That's one side. But there's also this uh, demand side that isn't quite clear right now because data also shows that we have a much higher percentage of people that don't have a mortgage because it's paid off. Right. And their property taxes are pretty low. But you know what? to buy a house, to build a house, and then have to buy that house brand new, way, that's a huge mortgage that people have to take out. Plus the property taxes will then increase, right? Like there's, there's a lot of these kind of interesting barriers where in a metro area, it's more likely that somebody that's older already has a mortgage. And so right. taking on another mortgage isn't that big of a deal. They're also right. gonna get a higher sale value for their home. And they that's actually right. may be able to buy something cheaper from what they just moved out of, right? So there's all these kinds of weird economic and de uh, uh, demographic wrinkles in all right. this. Things just look different. 
Well, um, and, and people today can't even afford to buy the home they're in if they had to rebuy it <laughs> in many absolutely. ways. So yeah. these are the, yeah, these, these for me, the housing unit situation is probably the most, most interesting aspect to get a window into what's happening in these rural communities, right? And that, that complexity, that nuance, I mean, that's just one level. I mean, I feel like with a lot of people, I mean, I've talked to people at the legislature where, you know, they'll say, oh, what's a big issue in rural Minnesota? I'm like, well, housing <laughs> is a pretty right. big one. Like, even if we're talking about workforce, we're talking yes. about housing. And I still have legislators tell me, how can you have a housing shortage when you have population decline? <laughs> right. No, <laughs> right? that's just it. Like, you got to like start really at this low level of being like, well, you can have decline in a household number increase. Actually, right. that's all we see uh, in a lot of these counties, particularly in kind of like that uh, EDR, uh, 6W in uh, upper Minnesota Valley, right? I think that's the one right I use where that whole region, I think their population decline since 1970 has been like maybe around 20% or something like that. Right, yeah. But their housing yeah. unit has increased by like almost 10%. It's yes, insane. It, it, it's insane. It's really a different way to understand data. And, you know, for it's been really rewarding for me to be able to, uh, my undergraduate was in statistics. So it's been really rewarding to be able to take stats out and like try to explain them to people and have them understand how this plays into, even how you drive your narrative in your town is based upon a simple statistic around total population. And all of a sudden your total population went down maybe by 1.5 percent well you're still a loser right you still lost people and but i think it's um we we just don't have a better language for it we don't have a better understanding of how to look at data because honestly data doesn't exist for everything data only exists for certain things so even if you want to better understand who's moving in and who be, who's moving out of my town there's no data source for that necessarily, a good data source for that. Though I would argue there are local data sources. Your city clerk knows exactly who just moved in and out. Your county assessor knows exactly who just moved in and out. Your property managers, right? So you've got people who come in and rent too. So I, I think, you know, there are some real ways to collect some of this data to better understand who's moving in and who's moving out if you want to do work in that area. It's just do not expect secondary data sources to have any of these um, kind of valid data points for you, especially at our small town. Yeah. And so there is this whole topic about data accuracy, even amongst our census now, but there's also the American Community Survey. There's all kinds of questions about that. So even the data we use on a day to day basis, we have questions about, you know, how accurate is it? And let's we'll dive into that uh, a bit later. But right now, I, I want to talk to you uh, now that we're kind of on this conversation about resident recruitment and what it means for small towns and rural areas and you know, looking at households. I know the University of Minnesota, you guys have done a couple surveys. Uh, one was more of a kind of informal survey of, for real estate agents, kind of talking about housing. And then the second one was a very technical academic project, which was the newcomer survey, right? Resident kind of around uh, surveying residents that have just maybe recently moved into a rural area. Let's start with the real estate agent one, kind of an informal, right. because it, I like this picture because it provides rural areas, this idea that not every survey has to be super technical or perfect, right? Like sometimes no, you right. just need just real basic, like, hey, get a picture of something. And I felt like yes. that real estate agent did that. You want to explain that to our listeners? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, during the pandemic, we had a, we had a large interest in better understanding, like who was moving in and who was moving out and for what reasons were they doing so. And we didn't have really a big academic study in this, but we did have an informal network of real estate agents that we had. Um, so we had uh, used our uh, connections through agencies across rural Minnesota to extend the survey out. We would ask, ask uh, real estate agents to provide uh, confidentially information about people seeking or recently buying homes across rural Minnesota. And what we had found was there were a lot of people who were moving for work from home. The whole, you know, headlines were rural, you know, <laughs> the headlines during the pandemic were rural can be saved by, you know, work from home and people and we're like, well, we've already been saved. Thank you very much. And now those people that think we're being saved by them moving there are finding out there's nowhere for them to live. So ultimately we did. We had this network of real estate agents and we wanted to better understand to what extent was that really happening? And we found, um, and some of these things are distinctly Minnesota here, is that it was roughly split in thirds. It was, you know, a third of people were like, hey, I can I can live anywhere now. And, you know, I think we talk a lot about work-life balance. We actually shift that around. It's life-work balance. And we've known this now. 
through the brain gain research that we'll talk about in just a minute, the brain gain research tells us very clearly people are not moving for just a job. So when we have a, a balance that we need to differentiate here, it, for us, it actually starts with life. So we start with the life work balance on that. So there are, there are those people who could afford and have the accommodation necessarily necessary to bring their jobs out to rural Minnesota. About a third of the movers were in that category. A third of people said interest rates were so low, they could not not do it, <laughs> right? And they were, this is historical levels of, of low interest rates. And the third reason that we heard was the George Floyd killing. We had a lot of people who uh, you know, were moving out of the metropolitan area because they did not want to be associated with the uh, crime uh, that they perceived to be occurring across the metro area. And again, it can be perception. They may not have actually experienced anything, but they, it's that perception of crime. And we see this as a sociologist across uh, across the country that people move for these crime reasons. We actually kind of relate this back to the early migration patterns of the 1970s even. So, you know, this, we talk about the brain gain, which is people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s that have been moving to rural communities really since the 70s. And when we think about the 70s, like what was happening in the 70s, it was very anti-urban. It was crime, homelessness. It was dog day afternoon. It was taxi driver kind of movies. It was an anti-urban kind of feel, which led to this explosion of growth of the brain gain into rural communities. And in the 70s is when we really started to fill up our homes in rural America, not just here in Minnesota. So we started to see remnants of this, you know, safety and security play its uh, play its own role in, in some of these migration patterns that we have today. Now, more recently, actually, we've heard um, a few more people say they are moving because of climate. We have climate migrants that are moving to Minnesota because we don't want to be in Oregon or, or California and deal with smoke for every day. Like, I don't need to go to air.gov every morning to see if I can go outside or our kids can play. So uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot more migration reasonings around that as we move forward, too. It, it, it was fairly interesting to kind of look at the diversity of reasoning why people were able to make the move and to see that we were um, seeing a lot of these kind of work from home reflections in the interests that people have in, in their rural communities and more to the point that they can and actually succeed in our rural communities. Because I think part of this narrative is that rural communities don't have broadband and that I could never work from home there. There's no internet in rural Minnesota. Well, I'll tell you what, rural Minnesota knows how to develop and institute broadband to the farm. We've been doing this for 15 years now. I mean, Federated Telephone in Western Minnesota laid fiber to the farm before there were large incentives. And I think why that happens is because we end up with a, uh, I mean, we've got a really strong field of cooperatives here in Minnesota. And as you know, cooperatives don't answer to stakeholders that are not local. Uh, they answer to shareholders that are living in our community. So I think we've got more incentives uh, on the public side to actually develop this type of, you know, broadband infrastructure. So, you know, we, we lived in Hancock for a long time, and then we moved to St. Cloud here in 2013. And when we moved, my internet got worse when I moved to St. Cloud, and we were serviced by a large, you know, national cable company. And when I moved from Federated, it was, it, it, it was a Pretty sad day to realize that Hancock, Minnesota has faster broadband than our, most of our major urban areas here in Minnesota. So uh, again, it's this narrative. It's it, When we talk about rural, we, we tend to have divide in, at the top of our mind. And really, um, I, in many ways, especially with regards to broadband, we know the fate way forward. You want to understand how to provide broadband to your rural communities, ask us. We'll tell you how. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I feel like we're probably at a tipping point again, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way, of seeing a lot of evidence of people moving back to rural areas or moving to a rural areas, not back to necessarily, um, due to the factors that you laid out, which is uh, uh, totally a lot, a lot of what I'm hearing too. What's been kind of interesting is, uh, so I feel like for the first time in a long time, employers are starting to understand this too. Like they're starting right. to understand this is about people, right? And what's been kind of interesting is we had an employer up north uh, talking to us at the Center for Rural Policy and Development saying, hey, I had this couple, their spouses, they're going to move from the Twin Cities up to, it was around Park Rapids. Yeah, no, it was around the Brainerd area. They had family there and they're like, ah, they just wanted to escape the cities. They had good jobs, but we hired them and they're excited. They're going to move up here. And they went back to tell their employer in the Twin Cities and the employer is like, no, you don't have to quit. You can just work from there and we'll uh -huh. pay you the same. <laughs> That's and the awesome. employer was just like, I can't compete with this now, right? So right. it's really interesting to see these trends where we've had people for a long time now moving out to a rural area, not necessarily for a job, but 
right. with the understanding that you might not make as much, but you're sacrificing wage for a better quality of life in their eyes, right. Right? like whatever that quality of life might be. This is a new moment again, where since we have such a workforce shortage across the board, so even metropolitan areas are facing a workforce shortage, there's much more incentive for people to really just choose wherever they want to live yes. and get paid well. Like the, no, that's right. the job economy is global rather than local or even regional. And so that's been a bit of a wake up call for, for our employers as well is, you know, resident recruitment's important, but even a competition in wages now, just the same as like, we just released that report on in the Amazon effect on, on, on revenue, right? If you look at retail, one of the big impacts that Amazon and online retail has had on the retail market as a whole is price uni- uniformity because everybody right. would go into a store, play with something, be like, oh, I like that. I'm going to see if I can find it cheaper online. Right. Right, right on their phone, right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind yeah. of the same thing now uh, with right. jobs. Like broadband right. is really shifting the whole playing field where I feel like we're going to start seeing wages. And we already are that gap closing between rural and metro because rural employers are starting to recognize that they're competing with wages being earned in metropolitan areas now. Right. Um, much more than they ever did before. So anyway, it's kind of a side interesting note to all of this is, you know. No, this has severe implications for our rural employers though, in terms of like, how do you manage a remote workforce? How are you going to compete against a company that can afford to have management in place that knows how to manage a remote workforce? They're using Microsoft Teams or they're, you know, they've got tools in place. When many rural employers or managers, especially, I, I just don't think understand the tools that are available to help manage a remote workforce. So we throw up our arms and say, I, I don't know, those people just probably aren't doing any work when they're at home. Yeah. You know, I think it's easy to say that. But on the other side, so I, I think this work from home is an actual benefit. The work from home is going to become a categorical benefit, just like, you know, 401k and retirement or for a medical benefit. So it's going to be this retirement. But we're starting to see on the other side too, actually higher wage incentives for people wanting to be on site. So when we see some employers are like, hey, we'll actually pay you more if you want to be on site. You know, so rather than the discount, they're kind of playing it the other way. But this is, this comes out loud and clear in this rural workforce movers study that we've done. So uh, it has since now been replicated across the state of Montana. So they did theirs during the pandemic. We did ours before the pandemic. What we have found is roughly, you know, a third of people or 30% are moving for a job or a job offer. And turn the other way is, you know, almost a third or two thirds of people are not moving for a job. They're like drawing this big triangle around the region and they look at homes and they look at parks and all these other things. And of course, people need to find a job eventually, but that's not the motivating factor for why they're starting to choose their residential location. And I think this is vital. Is there, there's a historical argument of the chicken or egg of economic development. And that is, do you know, in the typical industrial recruitment model, it's jobs attract people. But today we are on the other side of that. Like jobs, you can you can have jobs and you might not even be attracting people for that type of job. On the other side, that is not why people make the move to our rural communities, is not because there is a job in town. Especially we did this study uh, too, and we, we published this paper with some uh, deed personnel around what we call resident recruitment. What we found is just 51% of Minnesotans work in the county that they live in. So, you know, I mean, I, just a reminder that our county boundaries were drawn during the time of horse and buggy that don't really reflect modern life. But really, when we look at like, how does this play out then? If you're an employer in a town and all you can show off is the housing in your town as a recruitment effort, you're missing the boat because people don't necessarily live in your town. And what about their spouse. You know, we, we call it hedging their household economic bets. So like, for example, people may live in Hancock because it's in between two economic centers, Morris and Benson. And so you see the cars peel off every day They're from a single household. So, you know, the husband going north or the wife going south or whatever it looks like. So I think where we put our homes has been decoupled from where we have our jobs to a great extent, it's become much more regional. So this is... Um, This becomes important because as an employer, during your recruitment effort, you need to realize that your job is not going to probably bring people here. It's going to be everything but the job that's going to be bring people here. So, for example, Ottertail County, Eric Osberg has the nation's first rural rebound initiative coordinator, and it is literally his job to help employers. I mean, he's got a variety of strategies there, but one of which is to help employers show off the community to potential employees. Right. So they're going to show off like, here's your benefits. Here's your wage package. Here's your coworkers. Here's your desk. You know, here's the tools that you would use. 
But now outside the door is where you're going to start living your life. So take people fishing for an hour, let them see what their life is really going to be like. And so, you know, we hear stories of this, that we had a, uh, there was a veterinarian in Western Minnesota who was like, you know, I timed it one day from the moment when I left work to the moment we got on the lake and it was 14 minutes because it took me five minutes to get home. I hooked up the boat and it was seven minutes or whatever it was. It was this, it was an incredibly small amount of time that she used, but she used it as an antidote all the time or an anecdote to, to share about, um, you know, what it was like. Because where would you be in a metro area? You would still be in traffic for another half hour, right? So it, it's these kinds of stories that we want to share about how people are able to live their lives. Because when we have a job first approach to life, I think we're missing the boat. And right now, as a sociologist, one of the things that I love is that labor has power right now. Typically, labor doesn't have a lot of power. So we've got a lot of labor power coming up. I was at Fargo a couple of weeks ago. A lot of students there were pretty excited to hear about this. And I'm telling them, you can be making demands right now. These are the, I mean, we're starting to get some, some ideas around, you know, equitable capitalism or whatever you want to call this, like there, we are starting to include people in the economic equation again, when typically in the past, I'll just say like we had policies for a long time around industrial recruitment that were like, hey, business, come on and move to our town. We have cheap land and cheap labor. Well, labor is people, right? And now we're coming to roost on how many of these businesses were built upon the back of the low wage labor model and now can't make it or potentially are arguing that they can't make it, right? But what does that really look like when you built a business community around a low-wage labor model? And how is that really going to look post-labor power? Very interesting to see how this is going to play out and the ability for our rural employers to attract people. And then more importantly, to actually retain them. Because it's one thing to get people to say, hey, I'm going to move to your community. But it's another thing for them to say they're going to be there in five years once they get there. And, you know, if they're up against a negative narrative in town, if they're constantly told like, oh, Kelly, I know you're new here, but man, you just got to learn how we do it around here. Like, <laughs> you know, it's this type of attitude that actually inhibits the growth of our small towns. But we know yeah. here in Minnesota, we are, we, we got a lot of groups actually doing resident recruitment across the state. We are, we are very lucky if you are listening to this show and you are outside of Minnesota you would be shocked at how many resident recruitment initiatives, how much community, rural energy we have going around positive news in this state. So I, I, I've got to say, I really feel lucky to be part of a rural development industry here in Minnesota that's filled with people dedicated to helping our small towns see themselves in new lights and with an asset-based lens. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting how much, uh, I mean, talking about the workforce issue, right? Like, um, when we talk about that, the workforce shortages, like we've been talking about it for five years, the Center for Rural Policy and Development, I feel like state demographers have been talking about it for at least 15 years, Deed right. has been telling folks this is coming, right? right? Um, and here we are, we're in the midst of it. And it's, it's really interesting because it's not only retirements, but it's also economic growth, right? Like we continue right. to see significant economic growth. So like the news and stuff, we'll talk about the economic crisis, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait. <laughs> What economic crisis are we talking? I don't understand what you mean. Yeah. We can't boom fast enough right now. So, yeah, exactly. You know, right? so, so I think it's fascinating to think about um, how, how, how our employers need to shift their perspective uh, a lot. I think in the past, it's the employers throw up their arms and say there's no housing or feel disconnected. When we have had more employers actually take a role in doing community development work and actually purchasing housing for their employees. And so I think there are some models out there. They're just not well-worn paths about how to do this in the future. Yeah, and I think this combination of businesses getting involved in some of these issues that I think would have been kind of considered fluffy in the past, you know, like some of these quality of right. life issues. Now right. they, I see them taking it seriously and be like, oh, I can't just tell this employee how great the job is. I also need to tell them how great it is to live here, yeah. which includes a lot of stuff that I'm not used to being involved in, right? So Right, an and then actually make sure that experience is good <laughs> like yeah, on the community right. side. Like, yeah. you know, it, it's not treating these new folks like warm bodies. I, I, I say constantly, we do have a warm body approach to new residents. We barely see them. We don't know who they are because we don't have welcome wagons like we used to. And so who are these people? How do they actually get invited when many times it's like, oh, Kelly, hey, you're new to town. Do you want to sit on our board? And like, I, I don't know who you are. I'm treating you like a warm body because I've got an open spot and I'm trying to get off the board, right? And the only way you get off the board in a rural community is to find your replacement. So I, I think in many ways, we have to rethink about how we, how we treat these young people that are moving in. I say young people now, but you know, right? It is people in their 30s and 40s and, and they're moving in here for because they've chosen 
to move into your small town. They're not moving here for pity. They're not moving here for any other reason other than hope and expectation of a future in this place. So if they run up against a negative narrative wall in town, why would they think they're going to stay there? So I would ask you, if you're if you continue a negative narrative about the best days are behind us or you know, kids need to leave to be successful or only the lucky few escape, like why would anybody want to move to your town if you continue a negative narrative like that? Yes, our small towns have went through significant changes for the past 60 years years. So have metropolitan areas, right? You know, the, none of the trends that we talk about are necessarily distinctly rural. It has to do with more of a changing globalization that impacts all places equally. And then what differentiates how we, how we um, work with that is how we respond to it is social capital. And that is how well do we work together? And if we don't do a very good job of working together, if, you know, we continue to call the young people names and say that they're entitled and lazy and whatever, why would they ever want to be involved with your group? Why would they ever feel an invested opportunity or invest in an opportunity to better the community when they're told that they're never part of the community? For six months out of the year here in Minnesota, it's dark when we get up and dark when we get home. And you wouldn't know if somebody, if somebody moved in like right down the street till the spring. And then you're like, hey, what happened to John and Nancy? I thought they were living two houses down, right? And so it's like, you've always got new people. There are always new people moving in. Do you even see them? How, 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 how does their experience go? I think this is where data doesn't exist. Data does not exist on newcomer experiences unless you actually ask them. So I think once we start to get into that story, and a colleague, Neil Inshai, talks about the journey that people take in the move. And we do this journey mapping and talk about what does that look like from the moment you're like, I don't want to live here anymore. I would really like to, you know, I really like the local foods community in Western Minnesota. I think it would be great to live out there. And then how do you move from that to actually moving in? And then how do you move from actually moving in to saying, I'm a part of the community? So. These are very long sequences of time, but for me, it starts with the house. It starts with the house. What kind of shape is that house in? Is it ready to move in? I mean, this is the this is the crux of change for me right now is it's hard to welcome in new people when there's nowhere for them to live. So we do say, if you are actively trying to recruit new people to move to your small town, and you're finding it difficult to find homes for those new potential residents, go visit with the seniors after church because they will tell you right off the bat who may be moving out in the next three to six months. And so this is, again, data does not, did not exist on homes that aren't on the market yet, but it does when you start working locally and talking to people about their intentions. So I, I think there's a lot of real people work that helps uh, you know, keep our rural communities just vibrant and you know places that people want to live. And, and these newcomers say they see this, they love it. So I, all I've got to say is keep up the good work. We're still here because of all the volunteer efforts of all these people over the past decades to make sure our small towns are more than viable places. Well, and I feel like we can't end this conversation until we have a discussion around the census. We were kind of excited leading into this year that we were going to have new decennial census data to kind of publish in the state of rural, not have right. to rely on the ACS so much. The release of the data is delayed. <laughs> uh, again, uh, seems like probably 2020 was the absolute worst year to try and implement the decennial census um, right. for many reasons. I think the pandemic, obviously, big reason. I think politically, it was a bad narrative around the census, uh, which adds all kinds of wrinkles into the data, while also uh, a whole kind of technical issue that the U.S. Census Bureau has introduced into the way that they're uh, aggregating the, the data and, and doing the calculations. Um, so I guess in your perspective, Ben, I mean, when the data does come out and let's say you're doing your updated kind of, we'll call it brain gain statistics for each county, how confident are you? Right, not at all right now. I am not confident about census data at all. And I hate to say that, but because um, typically the census is, been, the, the, the decennial census specifically has been the most stable source of counts of our people, of characteristics of our people, of our homes uh, that we've really ever had in this country. And we shifted over the ACS a number of years ago, and that has been for the worst for our rural communities. But then the, now the 2020 census data comes out and there's a much larger hurdle. And this is something called differential privacy. And what this is, is it, it's basically a statistical noise that's introduced at the very small geographies. So for example, uh, and they introduce this for privacy. So for example, let's, uh, let's say there's a black woman that lives on a block in an urban area and there's only one. And then you look at the census data and you see that that one black person has an income of $140,000 saying right now that person 
is identified. So what the census has done is at the block level and the block group level is they've introduced noise into this. And this noise means instead of one, it's going to say three or four, or it'll say zero. And that one will have been moved over to an adjacent geography or a, a geography that may be not necessarily adjacent, but within the same county or region. So essentially what the Census Bureau has done is turned our counts into estimates. And we don't know the margin of error anymore. This is very similar to the American Community Survey, but this is called differential privacy. So when you look at housing number, or when you look at population numbers, I don't actually know if that's true because you know it, while this was kind of the cautions around differential privacy were introduced because of, because of an urban problem. Well, many of our rural communities are as big as an urban block. So now when we look at hey the the data for town X uh, shows a population gain of thirty four people. Is that really true? I don't really know because we don't have any way to know how much noise was actually introduced at that level. So the state level does not have any noise introduced to it, but anything below the state level in terms of population number has differential privacy applied to it. So no longer can I really rely upon these as counts. I will call them estimates, but I don't even know what the margin of error is. And, and, and this is a problem at the total population number. Now, if I were to split this down, which typically my brain gain analysis looks at cohorts of people in, in age groups of five, so like 30 to 34 year olds and 35 to 39 and 40 to 44 year olds. Well, now if there's differential privacy applied to this, every one of those age categories now has, has error applied to it potentially. And I don't know. So I can't actually do a valid count to count analysis anymore. Now it's a count to an estimate with an unknown margin of error analysis, which is totally unreasonable for me to ever do any type of academic study on. So that said, um, yes, I'm very sad. I will not be able to continue that research, though we do have other data sources that tell us, you know, that this is happening. These 30 to 40 year olds had, sorry, 30 to 50 year olds have in the past been bringing in their kids in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We can still see that in school enrollment data. So there's other sources to get at my kind of brain gain issue, but this is a much bigger problem. And I would love to have the rural development industry be better informed with regards to the impacts of differential privacy on the total population figures. And we haven't even gotten into the second level of data yet. The census has only released the top level, you know, our city and township total population and housing numbers. And that's it. We have, and, and by race, race and ethnicity as well. But that's it. We haven't gotten into any other details in terms of incomes or other things that we typically uh, look at in census data. So um, it, it, it's been, um, it's been disheartening for me to see some of the challenges that we're going to have. And even more disheartening to see people use the data as if it's real as if it's a count and to say hey you know we've got 34 homes to build in town well uh actually not like the 34 number or number of houses or number of people it might actually be minus 21 you might have actually lost people instead of gained 35 we don't really know so I would just like to caution everyone before you start to use decennial census data, try to better understand what differential privacy is first and better understand how that can impact your data before you start relying upon this as count. Now, I think we can use this for general trends. And when we start to aggregate our results into regions, it becomes the noise becomes less, right? But at the same time, we always want our city data. I, I'm not really too hip on looking at that data right now and using that as a count. These will be the numbers put on your sign outside of town, but in terms of like making actual financial decisions based upon that number, I would uh, I, I would not be throwing caution to the wind with any decisions at that point. So, One other thing too that I've had concerns about with the census, not concerns, but just kind of unfortunate is both the pandemic and then in Minnesota, I think with uh, George Floyd and just kind of the tension that surrounds the metropolitan area during 2020, there was probably significant changes in trends or movements and lots of migration. A lot of stuff was happening while a census was being conducted. And right. one of the things I think is unfortunate is we're not going to probably see it in the numbers. So like, even though what a community might be feeling and sensing and seeing will not be represented in data, but yet the data will make the headlines not right. the actual what's going on. Right? No, right. Right. And so yeah, that's I, something that's just unfortunate, I feel like. 
Yeah, and I think they've realized that they have a pretty significant undercount issue in minority communities, especially high in the minorities. I think they're doing a special project right now. So there have been a number of issues that have arisen when people are like, oh, wait a minute, data, what is this telling me again? Um, I don't think that's right. You know, so in terms of the underrepresented communities, they're the ones that, that are actually having some special projects analyzing some of that data to try to estimate the impact of the undercounts that they've got going on. Because again, you've got levels of, you know, high highest level of distrust in federal government in, in history. And you know, why are people going to fill out this census form that they've got, even though it's you know federally mandated and legally required, but that's not going to stop people. That's not going to stop people from not completing it at that point. So yeah, I, I think more and more we realize that data is only data is only so good. You know, our, you know, you and I know this. We deal with data every day. Um, but there are plenty of people who just look at this as the number. This is our number. And that's we got to make decisions based upon that number. Right. I think it's unfortunate that we're at a point in time where technology and statistics has advanced so much that the data should be getting more accurate, right. not less. Right. No, that's right. <laughs> and, and so I look at this and I'm just like, really, really, it's uh, it's going to be 2022 here in a few weeks. And we're still right. talking about the data being bad. Right. And they, they just opened up the count resolution question process, which communities can go and uh, question their, their numbers if they think it's wrong. But there, we do know there have been some significant issues around group quarter populations. So they've actually undergone a special project in the past week. They've started that up here to reevaluate group quarters numbers. They're going back to all group quarters locations, asking them to verify their 2020 numbers. So in group quarters are things like uh, dormitories, prisons. So for example, I, I know there were issues across the country where many dormitory numbers like say a number was submitted, like literally submitted on Friday that our dormitory number is 404. And it got put onto the dormitory number, but never asked, added to the total population number for that community. So there are very simple problems with some of this data that we've uncovered as we started to look at this uh, when the data first appeared. So we are only asking more questions rather than fewer at, at this point. Yeah. And I think it's worth mentioning too, you know, what Census Bureau, they were not immune to the pandemic. So I think you had a lot of staff working from home or not getting in the right. office. Like it, as much as everybody threw it in turmoil, it did the same to the Census Bureau. So again, just like really unfortunate time to try and implement it. At this point, I almost wish we just would have delayed it a year and just right. said, you know what, we're <laughs> going to have the census in 2021. Right. Let's get past this major global pandemic. But yes. that's the way it goes. Well, the, for now on, this decennial census will just have a big asterisk next to it. We'll just have to control for that in our region. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. the, the last thing with regards to the decennial census is the housing unit numbers. Um, the housing unit numbers really hit our radar, radar early on. And Kelly, you're on this kind of team that we put together with Minnesota, Montana demographers. And we, we, we were starting to look at these housing numbers. And I'll say this, that the housing unit numbers are not subject to differential privacy. So there are, there's not noise introduced to housing unit numbers. But what we found is that, for example, like Aiken County, the number of housing units uh, went down by 13% from 2010 to 2020. And that just does not seem reasonable in any way whatsoever. Uh, Grant County lost 5%. Kitson County lost 13% of their housing units. Monoman lost almost 9% of their housing units. We started uh, Traverse County 9.5%. Like if, if these numbers are to be believed, this would have been the greatest decade of housing demolition we have ever experienced in this country. So even when I look at the national numbers, we look at, you know, of the 783 counties that lost housing units in the previous decade, 88% continue to lose now, which, right, if you lost before, you're probably going to continue losing. But of the 2,300 uh, counties, uh, 2,354 counties that gained housing units in the previous decade, now 38% of them are losing housing, housing unit numbers. And houses just don't kind of get up and disappear all that quick. So this really raised a lot of questions. And we are trying to better understand, like, are these real? And we really cannot answer this question. It was like, well, wait a minute, there are, there are potential, there are a lot of potential points of error here. So between 2010 and 2019, like 92% of our counties gained housing units. But now here in Minnesota, like more than half are losing housing units. How can that be when you went from like, oh, we had, you know, Aiken County had like 4,200 housing units or whatever it was. And now they're, or sorry, 13,000. And now they're down to 12, six. Like, how did that, you just disappeared all these housing units. So we were really, um, I would say confused and still are to an extent because census does not really describe the process by which they create 
created their mailing list. Because this is essentially their mailing list, right? Um, it's where did they go to find the people? Because this is the starting point for the census, is the housing unit. You go to the housing unit, you count the people, how old are they, right? The occupations, income, age, all that. So this is like, well, if the housing units are off by this amount, then they're, are they really finding everybody in the data becomes the more pertinent question, which if you only hit, right, uh, how many housing units and, uh, you know, if you only hit the 13,944 housing units in Aiken County, um, what about the 2,000 other ones that are missing now? And what about the people that were in there before that were apparently not counted in this decennial census? So there's a lot more questions with regards to impacts on population data that start with our housing unit data. Yeah. I think this is a whole another podcast episode. Right. <laughs> Just talking about the census coming out. Maybe we could plan that uh, for next month. But right. I think, Ben, I really appreciate your time. This is great. And thanks for participating in the episode and having a conversation about data. It's always great talking to you about this stuff. Kelly, it's always fun. You're a great data mind. I just love having you here to explain data to everybody else as well. So yeah. thanks for being yeah, here appreciate for us. It. You've been listening to the Center of Everywhere podcast, where we explore stories of rural Minnesotans who are making a difference in their communities. Rural isn't in the middle of nowhere. It is in the center of everywhere. Everywhere.